Dynamic equilibria are kind of interesting because they're dynamic. There's stuff constantly going on. And if we do something to perturb our system because there's something going on, we're, we're going to affect those ongoings and we're going to get a response. Now there's a guiding principle called Le Chatelier's principle, which is going to help us to predict what sort of response we're going to get. And what Le Chatelier's principle says is that our response is going to be to partially counteract the disturbance in some way. Now let me give you an example. So here I have a chamber that's airtight, there's a piston on it, and there's some dividing membrane between two regions in the chamber. So we have some gas up here and we have some gas up there and they're, they're separated by some airtight film like the skin of a balloon. Well, let's say we now perturb this system of equilibrium, of this pressure pushing up and this pressure pushing down. So we will move down the piston. If we do this very rapidly, then initially all the change will be to this region up here. So we've decreased the volume, so we've greatly increased the pressure. That's our disturbance. We've modified the equilibrium. Well, what's the system going to do? Well, it's not going to just sit here with this pressure being much larger than this pressure. What's going to happen is that our, our membrane is going to move downward until we reach the point where the pressure up top matches the pressure on bottom again. And so if we restrict our consideration to just this region here, we increase the pressure and now the system changed to decrease the pressure in this region here. Now overall, the pressure here is still going to be larger than what it was before we compressed the piston, but it's certainly going to be smaller than if we only took the movement of this piston into consideration and did not consider the readjustment of the system. So that, in essence, is Le Chatelier's principle. And it applies to a lot of things, not just in chemistry, it will also come up in things like economics, so it's a very applicable principle. It will happen whenever we have this you know, dynamic equilibrium of something pushing one direction, something pushing the other direction, and we alter one of these effects. So for chemical reactions, what we are going to consider is a situation where we have equilibrium between our forward reaction and our reverse reaction. So they've reached constant rates. And the way that we're going to be able to perturb them chemically is going to be by changing the concentration or the temperature, the volume or the pressure. And our response to these changes is going to be limited to this reaction. So we can respond to any of these by either moving to the right or moving to the left. And the question is which one of those is going to happen? If we move to the right we say that products are favored or right side is favored. If we move to the left, we say that reactant sort of left side is favored. Well, our strategy here, we have to do three things. First, we have to ask what changed. So for example, we've decreased the pressure of our system. Okay, well now Le Chatelier's principle says that we're gonna have something occur to minimize that change. So what's that gonna be? Well, if we've decreased the pressure, we are going to have to partially increase the pressure in response to offset that change. Now the, the last question then is how can the reaction cause this increase in pressure to occur? Now remember our two over reaction is just this equilibrium arrow. So we have to ask moving the left to the right, can it do anything in order to offset that change? And the answer might be something like produce more gaseous products. If we produce more gases for our chamber, then that would provide an increase in pressure. And so that would tell us then, you know, whichever side of the reaction had more gas on it, that would be the direction that would be favored by this change. All right, well, let's say that we have a reaction and we affect its concentration. So for, for this reaction here, we have A combined with two molecules of B to produce C and D. We add some more A once it's at equilibrium, and now we want to know what the reaction is going to do in response. So our stress here is that we 
added a bunch of A, so we increased its concentration. Now we want to figure out what the response is going to be. And the response is going to have to be the opposite according to Le Chatelet's. System has to do something to now decrease the amount of A partially. So what can the system do in order to make sure that our quantity of A decreases? Well, we can have A react with B in order to produce C and D. So the concentration of A will go down. The concentration of B will go down twice as much since every molecule of A consumes two molecules of B when it reacts. And we'll get back an equal amount of C and D. And in general, if you write in the arrows like this, um, so after you figure out your change and then your response, then on whatever side the, the response is, all those arrows will point the same direction, and the arrows will point the opposite direction on the other side of the equation. So it's, it's very easy to quickly figure out what will happen to all the substances. So, so this is our, our conclusion, is that the right side is going to be favored because A is going to react with B to produce more C and D. Now we can also explain this kinetically. Le Chatelier's doesn't really explain anything, it just lets us predict what's going to happen. But of course there's a reason that this is true, and our kinetic explanation would be if we now think of the, the rate here on the left side of the reaction, if it occurs in a single elementary step, it's going to be some constant times concentration of A times concentration of B squared, and the reverse rate is going to be some constant times the concentration of C and the concentration of D. Now what have we done here? We have increased the concentration of A, which is going to increase rate 1, and so now these are no longer equal as they were at equilibrium. This rate is now larger, and so it's going to be producing more C and D then C and D can convert back into A and B. Well, eventually, because it's, this reaction is more vigorous and it's producing more products, we're going to increase the concentrations of C and D, which is going to increase this rate. And so eventually, we're going to reach the point where those rates are equal, and we'll be back at equilibrium. Now let's consider what happens if we adjust the temperature of our system Let's say we have an exothermic reaction where some substance A converts into substance C and we heat the system, so we increase the temperature. Well, our trick to figuring out what's going to happen here is an exothermic reaction gives off heat, so we are going to go ahead and put heat in as a product in our reaction. Now when we stress the system, we are adding more heat since we are increasing the temperature. So that's our effect. Now Le Chatelier says we're going to have an opposite compensation from the system. So something has to happen to decrease the amount of heat energy present. And the way that we can do that by the reaction is considering heat is a product, it can combine here with our C and move the reaction this way, produce more A. So the left side will be favored in this case, and more reactants will be produced. Now what happens here to the equilibrium constant? Well, if we were to write it out for the reaction as written, then we would have concentration of C times concentration of heat divided by the concentration of A but this was just pretend for working out Le Chatelier's. We can't actually measure a concentration of heat, and so it doesn't actually appear in our equilibrium expression. Instead, it gets built into the constant here. So here, if we divide the heat out over on the left, then we'll get the equilibrium expression that you know, we're familiar with that we would have actually written down for this reaction. But this heat is still having an effect here, and what the value of this constant is. 
So it should be clear, the way we've written it here, that the equilibrium constant is going to decrease as the temperature increases. And we have a, a larger denominator here. Now let's consider an example in which we affect the pressure of the system. So let's suppose that we have a setup where we have a piston, so we can decrease the volume and increase the pressure of our system. And within this chamber here, we have nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and ammonia gas, and they've all been allowed to reach equilibrium. So where their, their rates of reaction forward and backward are equal and the concentrations don't change. So what's going to happen, if anything, to these pressures and concentrations when we compress the system? Well, Schottlees says that once we increase the pressure, that we are going to have some response to decrease the pressure. Now, what can our system do, moving to the right or to the left here, in order to decrease at least partially the overall pressure? Well, the pressure is proportional to the number of moles of gas in our system. We can't actually affect the volume because our this is a rigid container for rigid piston. And so that's not going to change. We might actually be able to affect the temperature, but you know, let's say that there's some stable external temperature and we wait long enough for this to equilibrate. So the only thing that we can affect then, if we can affect it, is the number of moles. Well, if we look at this equation here, we'll note that there are four moles of gas on the left side and two moles of gas on the right side. And so what that means is that we can compensate by converting the reactants here into products. That will, will decrease the pressure and provide for this offset that Le Chatelier has promised us. Now do be careful here. This, this is a good rule which will apply in general, but Note that it's only for gases. So if you have you know, other solids and liquids here, really their presence does not have any significant impact on the, the pressure of the system and does not affect these concentrations at all. So in that case, um, you're just gonna count up the number of gas molecules, not the total number of molecules. As mentioned previously, Le Chatelier does not you know, explain why this happens. It just helps us to decide what is going to happen. But we can have some insight into why this happens by considering the kinetics. So our rate law, assuming that we have this reaction occur in a single molecular collision transition state, is going to be the rate is equal to some constant times the concentration of this times the concentration of this to the power of three for the forward rate, and then our reverse rate, some constant times the concentration of this squared. Now, when we compress this system, we have increased the, the pressures and the concentrations of all these gases, because now they're, they're confined to a smaller volume and concentration is mass per unit of volume. So let's say that we, we double this here. Well, in that case, our rate for the forward reaction, we're gonna double the concentration of nitrogen and double the concentration of hydrogen, and we'll double the concentration of ammonia in the reverse rate. Now for the forward rate, we have a factor of two and a factor of two cubed. So that's gonna be a factor of 16 increase. For the reverse rate, we have a factor of two squared, so that becomes four. And so our reverse rate increases by four times, but our forward rate increases by six times. So clearly our reaction is going to be favored moving in this direction and produce more of these ammonia gas molecules, which will have the effect of decreasing the pressure just like Le Chatelier has promised us.
Another case to consider for pressure in Le Chatelier's is this what happens to our system in equilibrium if we add an inert gas. So this is, is different from using our piston now. Instead, we just inject some more gas in the container and this gas is not involved in our reaction. So it's not gonna react, but how is it going to affect the quantities of these molecules? Well, the answer is that it doesn't. We're gonna increase the total pressure, but the partial pressures, remember the partial pressures are when you consider just a gas by itself, and those are the ones that we would throw into our equilibrium expression, are not gonna increase. Or we can think of it as concentration. This is the same number of molecules and the same unit of volume, the concentration is not gonna increase. So they're gonna have the, the same quantities that go into our rate expressions, which means we're, we're not going to affect anything. And if you think about these molecules all bouncing around here, the, the presence of these other molecules doesn't affect how likely these are to collide with each other. Um, all the presence of these other molecules means is that there's gonna be more molecules bouncing in the walls of the container. So pressure increases, the reaction, however, is not affected. One last note, it might have occurred to you to wonder what would happen to our system at equilibrium if we added a catalyst. Catalysts have the effect of increasing reaction rates by decreasing the activation energy. Now for an equilibrium reaction, we are going both forward and reverse across this transition state. And so this reduction in activation energy is going to affect both rates. Both of them are going to increase. Now what's going to be the overall effect for this exothermic reaction that we have here? We can use the Arrhenius equation to calculate what the change in the forward rate and the reverse rate would be due to the presence of this catalyst. So I'll call our new equilibrium constant that we're going to generate Keq prime, and we'll have our new forward rate and our new reverse rate now to get the rate constant, the Arrhenius equation is, we have our, our frequency factor, and we multiply it by our exponential term, which in this case, we're gonna decrease by a certain quantity. I'm gonna call that x. So this decreases by x for our top rate, and then the, the rate for our reverse also has an activation energy, Ea2, which is gonna decrease by x, all in that exponential term. Well, if we have something that's added or subtracted in an exponential, we can go ahead and factor it out. So this is the, writing this here is the same as, as multiplying by e to the positive xrt, which is two minus signs cancel out. So we'll go ahead and do that. Well, note that the same thing happens on the bottom. We wind up with and e to the x over rt that we can, can multiply by. So those will just cancel out, in which case we will be left with our expressions for just k1 and k minus one. So this is going to be our normal equilibrium constant unmodified. So adding a catalyst does not have any effect on the equilibrium constant, it's gonna remain the same constant. It's not going to, to shift us one direction or the other. Now, but catalysts do increase the rate at which the equilibrium is established because they increase the forward rate and the reverse rate, so they enable both of them to converge on that equilibrium condition faster. That's actually very useful. You don't wanna wait forever for your reaction to occur. And if you're doing something like constantly removing the products of a reaction, then Le Chatelier says that we're gonna be continually having a favored product side as the reactants react to produce more products to replace those which were removed. So your catalyst can still help you get the most out of your equilibrium reaction. 